I teach at the University of Chicago at our Booth School of Business. The, Booth's, the school itself started in 1890. John D. Rockefeller took some of his vast fortune and um, gave it to the school. In 1898, we started the business school, second oldest business school in the world. And um, we're now global research professional school that uses scientific foundations and practical frameworks to train young entrepreneurs and business managers and some government leaders uh, to make a difference in the world. You may know that the university has won more Nobel Prizes than any other school per capita. We're a very small institution. One reason I think that's important for you is that Durango can be overshadowed by some of the other communities, not only in Colorado, but with global players that you compete with for economic opportunity and tourism. But small can be beautiful if you're focused and play the game right. So even though we're a small university, we win more Nobels than any other school per capita. We want per, per capita of our faculty we have won more Nobel Prizes than almost any nation state in the world because we focus on doing the few things that make us great in the minds of the people we're trying to serve. Um, U.S. News and World Report says that we're number one in the United States. This report came out in March of this year. We're tied with another school you may or may not have heard of called Harvard. Um, the Economist, ever since 2012, has ranked us either one or two globally as a business school. So we are number one or number two in every league chart we care about. If we're not number one or number two, it does not make my slides. It's an important way to think about life. I noticed that you're ranked... Um, one of the top 10 best places to go on a budget vacation. You know, it's great to be in these lists, and um, we're in the top 10 in almost any way you would evaluate a business school. Let's focus, though, on strategy and strategic thinking. Some of you love the word. You've been playing strategy games your whole life. I remember uh, summer afternoons on a rainy day when my friends would gather in a house and play risk for hours or you may have played chess or you may play some of the um, strategy games now on a handheld on your phone other people don't like the word strategy they think strategy is vague mystical worthless it's all about execution both matter it doesn't matter how well you execute if you put your ladder on the wrong wall. Strategy is deciding what wall to put the ladder on. Execution is climbing it efficiently and effectively. But what is strategy? Well, I'm going to tell you stories. The research is quite clear that the number one way to learn something is, ah, what do we call that? Experience. But not everyone can have the experience necessary, especially early in their career, to learn strategy. The second best way to learn is from stories. The human mind is hardwired to learn from stories. And one of the skills that we're realizing is in the complex quantitative age, the ability to tell Stories with numbers can set you apart in the world. A friend of mine is a um, finance and accounting professor at a small liberal arts college. He wins Teacher of the Year over and over, and he's famous for storytelling. You can imagine how good this man has to be if you win Teacher of the Year teaching accounting to general ed kind of courses. And I asked him, give me an example, and he said, well, one year I was teaching break-even analysis, a key concept in business, not just in accounting. And it was a spring day in the Chicago suburbs, and I was in a large lecture hall filled with 100-plus uh, liberal arts students, and I watched their eyelids droop as the <laughs> went on and on. He said, you know, the weather's good outside. Let's go outside onto the quad. Remember that day your professor took you out of the classroom? It's like you're just so happy. And if you're 
people like you and me who live in the north, even if we or in wintry places, even if you love the snow, there's something about those first spring days. He took this class out onto the south end of the quad, and he pointed to the north end, the sidewalk, and he said, that north sidewalk represents break even. I'd like you to estimate how many steps it's going to take to get to break even. Now, estimation is an essential skill for leadership. Uh, middle managers want precision. Senior leaders want it. They know they'll never get it. They've got to get an order of magnitude of estimating the opportunity, the possibility, the steps it'll take. And so we begin to teach people how to do estimation early in life. I remember in first grade, Mrs. Bass's class, she brought in a clear jar filled with jelly beans. And she said, class, write down an estimate of the number of jelly beans in this jar. The person who gets the closest to the number gets the jar. Now, to a six-year-old boy, this is nirvana. But the problem is that six-year-old Greg Bunch wasn't very numerate. Probably the biggest number I could count to was around 100, and I quickly eyeballed, and I thought there's more than 100 there, so I made up a number called gadzillion. So it was gadzillion jelly beans in the jar. I didn't win the jar. I, I, I understood about estimation, but my, my combination of estimation with numeracy wasn't there yet. We need to teach people how to estimate effectively, and it's especially important in strategic thinking because strategy is solving ill-structured problems. Managers solve well-structured problems with greater and greater efficiency. But strategy is dealing with things that we haven't seen exactly before, not exactly in this configuration, and making bets into the future, making estimates and guesses and thinking about what is it going to take to pull this off. And so he said to the students, I'd like you to estimate how many steps it's going to take to get from the south end of the quad to the north end to break even and write the number down. And the students did that. They're all excited. Uh, he says, I'm going to make it a little harder for you. Get in teams of five. Link arms, three of you face forward, and those three take three steps forward toward the north end of the quad. Two of you face backwards, you take two steps away from the quad, and now estimate how many steps it's going to take to get to break even. Now, this is a much more realistic problem because if you're not a sole contributor, you realize that your success is getting work done through other people, and it turns out moving groups of people is far less efficient than moving yourself. The only thing I need to do to illustrate is I'm sure all of you travel all the time and you've stripped down your travel to, you know, I only wear slip-on loafers. I carry no two-liter bottles in my suitcase and I can get through TSA like that. You take the family on vacation to Orlando. You've done it, I can tell. You can't have that bottle in your suitcase. Why did you have lace-up boots to the... By the way, these conversations do not help you stay married for 39 years. And so I've learned to just make haste slowly. As leaders, we need to instill urgency in our teams, but we also have to understand that teams move at a different pace than highly uh, achieving people like yourselves. And so he's role modeling this for them. He says, write down how many steps it's going to take for the team to get there. And he says, let's go. Boom. And the students take off three steps forward, two steps backwards. They're laughing. They're having the best time, all except for one student. He was a math major. He came over to my friend, and he's livid, and he says, this is a waste of my tuition dollar. It's a simple equation that could have been written on the whiteboard in a moment. We could have moved forward. Now, remember, my friend has been winning Teacher of the Year awards forever, and he's dealt with these 19 to 22-year-old angst and hormone-driven young people, and he's like an Aikido master. He just allows the energy to roll around him. He says, it's a simple equation. I know it. I could write it on the whiteboard. Just watch what happens. And the students move forward, and they move backwards, and they move forward, and they move backwards, and finally one team gets to the north end of the quad, and they're so excited, they're the first ones to get to break even, and they cheer. Is it Richard or Rich or Dick? All three? All three. <laughs> 
and a few more. <laughs> yeah, you can call me anything you like. <laughs> Just don't call me late for supper, right? Um, gets to the north end of the quad, and the team is so excited. They're cheering. They made it. And my friend says, quiet, students. Quiet, students. You've just made it to break even. You haven't made any money yet. He turned to the math student and he said, this class is filled with all kinds of students, brilliant in different ways, but many of them are not as numerate as you are. They're not going to remember this formula, but they're never going to forget this story, and neither will you. As we lead people in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous age that's more and more data-driven, it is incumbent on us as leaders to lead using appropriate storytelling. How well do you tell stories? How well does your organization tell stories? Do you have a culture of storytelling that gets to the point? So I'm going to tell you some stories. Um, Kyle, I teach in a very nonlinear fashion. I tell stories within stories. Sometimes I absolutely forget where I'm at. So if, if I forget where I'm at in the middle of this one, I'm telling a story about the importance of storytelling for strategic leadership. Okay, so help me with that. And um, this story is about Ann Dodge. Two days after Christmas in 2004, Ann drove into Boston. She had an appointment at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center with Dr. Myron Falchuk, a gastroenterologist. By Anne's own reckoning, he was the 30th subspecialist she'd seen in the last 15 years. When Anne was about 20 years old, she developed an eating disease such that after many meals, she would feel nauseous and go to the toilet and regurgitate. She went to her family practitioner who recommended antacids. Uh, this did not solve the problem. She went back to him. Um, he suspected the etiology, the source of her disease, but rather than diagnose, he referred. That referral set Anne on a journey through the medical system that would last for 15 years. It's the late 80s young woman purging after meals. What kind of doctor do you think the general practitioner referred her to? A psychiatrist. When the psychiatrist meets Anne, he quickly frames her up and says, oh, young lady, you have anorexia nervosa with bulimia. It's a life-threatening disease. And he puts her on a treatment strategy to deal with this condition. Fifteen years later, she weighs 82 pounds. Her endocrinologist says that her bone structure is similar to the advanced osteoporosis of an octogenarian. Her orthopedic surgeon has found a crack in a metatarsal. By the way, I was giving this talk to a group of orthopedic surgeons. Where's the mercy people? Are there any mercy people here in the room? So I was giving this talk to a group of orthopods, and one of the guys just interrupted and said, which metatarsal? Now, this is the first time in my life I ever considered the possibility there might be more than one metatarsal. <laughs> it turns out it's the long bones on your feet. Um, and I, you know, you have a choice as a teacher. When somebody asks you a question like that, you can like say, it's time for a break, um, <laughs> and pull out Wikipedia. Or you can say, I don't know. And I said, I don't know. And all the orthopods laughed like this professor of business is clueless about, uh, you know, bones. But then they said, but we're clueless about the business of healthcare, And they actually put me on their board later. So, um, so what's happening is she's losing so much calcium, she's cracking apart on the inside. It's, it's horrible. Um, her hematologists have ordered a bone marrow biopsy, and she's producing no new blood platelets, essentially. Um, her nutritionist is giving her 3,000 calories a day of carbohydrates, mostly pasta. She's still losing weight. So the nutritionist and the psychiatrist know that she's a pathological liar. You can't take that much in and still lose weight. She's been hospitalized in this year four times in a mental health facility, given antidepressants that have irritated the lining of her stomach, um, and she's basically dying. 
It's at this mo moment that her boyfriend intervenes and finds Dr. Falchuk. Uh, when I told this story to my MBAs the first time, one of them just gasped, she still has a boyfriend? Um, he's the hero of the story in many ways. Uh, by the way, Kyle, I'm, I'm not telling the story to talk about medicine. I, I don't know if World Pay or University of Chicago Booth School were going to do much on dealing with this, but I'm telling you about business. Because business is not a sole contributor thing. The doctors aren't going to heal Anne. Anne's not going to heal herself. Um, it's going to take a collection of people involved, and business is that way. There are providers, customers, and supporters, and referrers, and we need to pay attention to all of them as we develop our strategies. In this case, this is an advocate who's referring for Anne, advocating for Anne. He finds Falchuk. Um, Anne goes to her doctor and asks for the referral, and of course he gives it to her. He calls Falchuk in Boston and says, look, she's an anorexic. She's got bulimia. Here's her case file. I'll send it to you. Keep her on the treatment regimen, which is exactly what Falchuk doesn't do. He, he reads the file. Of course, he wants the historical data. He reads it very carefully. But on this day in December, when Anne arrives in his office, he goes out to meet her. And he brings her into his office, and he pulls out a chair for her, and he comes from behind his desk, and he, he pulls out his uh, chair, and he gets a notebook, and a pen, and he asks Anne to talk about the onset of her disease. And Anne reports, she wanted to scream at him, can't you read, don't you have my file? But she quietly says, don't you have my file? He says, yes, Anne, and I've read it, but I'd like to hear your story. A lot of businesses listening to customers, uh, Steve Jobs says, get even closer to your customers than ever so, cl and this part's the classic Steve Jobs, so close to them that you understand what they need well before they know it themselves. Um, incredible arrogance, except for the fact the man did it over and over. Uh, you've got to get really close to your customer. You've got to listen to them. Falchuk believes the patient often knows the problem, just doesn't have the vocabulary. And so as he listens to her and listens deeper and deeper and writes things down, he's taking qualitative data in. He gets up and conducts a physical exam, which would be normal in the course of things, palpitates her, but uh, the place he strangely starts is actually with her hands. He, he, he starts by examining her cuticles, and he turns her hands over and traces the lines of her palm like he's a fortune teller. He looks at her teeth and gums, palpitates her, takes a fecal sample, says, Ann, um, I'd like to do a quantitative test, do an endoscopy. Now, you know, these are very intrusive. You put a tube down your throat with a camera on it. Anne accepts this, and now he's got historical data, qualitative data, first-person data, uh, and quantitative data, and he sits and he thinks for himself. And he comes up with a diagnosis that's different than all of his predecessors who've taken the Hippocratic Oath to first do no harm. What do you think he diagnoses for Anne? It's not anorexia nervosa with bulimia. It could have been, but it wasn't. What would a gastroenterologist, celiac disease, and what were the doctors doing to her? 3,000 calories a day of pasta. In their desire to heal Anne, they're killing her and saying she's the problem. She's the pathological liar. <laughs> the good news is the doctor comes up with a new strategy Anne adheres to it, and Anne's healed. I embedded in this story is kind of everything I know about strategic thinking in a VUCA world. Really good people trying to do the best they can, actually screwing things up and making it worse. Uh, people who really have a huge problem, but they begin to despair and don't think there's hope. A, a, a loving companion who hasn't given up hope, an expert who thinks differently. Now, he probably almost certainly thought differently because he was a gastroenterologist, but he breaks out of the frame of the guild and he re-examines the question, you know, what is the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Um, we live in a very complex age, and it's easy to give up hope. You can have a fire, you can have a drought, you can be competing against other people and go, oh, that's just our lot in life. Or you can say, how do we win? And I like to hang around winners. 
Uh, there are three words you need to distinguish when you think about strategic thinking. Goals, uh, strategy, and management, all three are important. The goal is the dream you have. The, the, the financial dream, the, the career dream, the family dream, in this case, is to have a healthy patient. Uh, strategy is the decision you make to accomplish the dream. It's thinking about how to get your goal taken care of. Uh, in this case, it's the diagnosis and the prescription are part of that strategic thinking, how to help and get back to health. And management is doing the work. It's adherence in the case of the story. All three are important. Uh, no successful person that I know of, except maybe somebody who's just incredibly lucky, but no successful person uh, works without goals. We have to have goals. But very many times what we'll see is strategic plans that are really goal statements and budgets. There's no strategic thinking in between. It's, it's just positive mental attitude and hard work, which we love. You have to have it. But we need to th think about how do we think. What are the decisions we make? What are the bets we make? Uh, being in a casino, are, can we be better betters? Uh, Texas Hold'em is a fabulous game for this because Texas Hold'em is a game of math, psychology, and luck. And you're making bets based on your understanding of the math, um, the tells of the people around you, and some level of luck. There are three traits we've seen in successful strategic thinkers. The first one is Superman. Uh, Superman has x-ray vision down and in. He sees where Lex Luthor has planted a bomb that threatens Lois Lane. Uh, as we've studied the best strategic thinkers in business, military, government, um, what we find is they see down and into their organizations brilliantly. Uh, they, they have a point of view. They know what's working and what's broken. But that's actually not strategic as such. That's a management skill. Good managers have that. The strategist sees down and in, but the strategist also sees another direction, up and out. The strategist scans the horizon. Um, Kyle, it's exactly what a hunter does looking for an elk. Scanning is a close reading of the environment to see your target. And you have to look up and out to do that. If you're looking down at your shoes, you're not going to see an elk, unless he's stepping on you, right? <laughs> and then you're probably the hunted at that point. Um, both angles of vision are important. Down and in is running the business today. Up and out is running the business tomorrow. Strategy is about the future. Uh, William Gibson, a fabulous science fiction author, says the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Think about that. Your job as a strategist is to see the future that's already here. It's just not very well distributed. To look up and out to things that are coming. Both are important. Down and in is the managerial aspect of the leader. Up and out is the strategic aspect of the leader. As leaders, we usually have to do both. We, we tend to defer to one. The second skill is the skill of the detective, like Sherlock Holmes. You know, Sherlock Holmes gets down at the, at the scene of the body. He starts at the body. He finds a long blonde hair, and the victim has short black hair. There's a uh, cigarette with lipstick on it, and the deceased has no lipstick. There's a ticket stub to the opera. He's looking at granular clues. He's asking questions like who, what, where, when. Questions are the new black. Uh, the person who asks the best questions leads the deals. Uh, how well do you ask questions? And then after he observes the scene of the crime, he retreats back into Baker Street and ruminates. I think he actually is smoking opium, but I'm not encouraging that. But he, but he needs to have this vacillation back and forth between getting out and getting in. Too much strategy is done inside the business, using spreadsheets and pivot tables, and, you know, good for you. But business strategy starts with the customer, solving a customer need, understanding the customer, get out of your freaking office. Go and see, two of the most important verbs you're ever gonna see in, in, in strategy, go and see. Get out of your office, get to where the value's created and work back from then, and then do the math. Then check your statistics, think like a detective. And the third one is Tinkerbell. 
Tinkerbell has the ability to turn dust into gold with her magic wand. What is capitalism at its best? It's taking a lower order good or service and transforming it into a higher order good or service that people are willing to pay for. What does a middle manager do? They run processes. And process is important. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. Process is important, but the company does not exist for the processes. The organization does not exist because you've written a really good process and adhered to it. The company exists to delight a customer who will pay you more because you understood a need they had. You took a lower order good or service, dust, and transformed it into a higher order good or service, gold, X-ray vision down and in, up and out. Detective mind, get close to the body, look at the little clues, then go back and ruminate and oscillate between the two and always remember that as important as process is, and it is important, the purpose of the business is not process. The purpose of the business is to create customers that will pay you ever and ever more for it. So take a moment and just think, what did you learn from these characters? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to speak about these, but it's important to reflect on it. Do you have a clear view down and into the organization, into what's working and what's broken? That's an essential managerial skill. If you can't see clearly down and into your organization, how can you fix that part of your vision? Uh, how much time do you spend looking up and out for things that can benefit or harm the organization, especially anomalies, those odd things in the universe? That's strategic thinking, up and out. How much time do you dedicate to the up and out? How much time do you spend out of the office where the opportunity lies, where the value is created? Go and see. How focused are you on turning dust into gold, taking a lower order good and transforming it into a higher order good or service that the customer will pay for versus only running the process? And process is important. Let me give you six iron laws of strategic thinking. It undergirds almost all strategy. These were developed by a close colleague of mine at the University of Chicago, a man who was both in business and academics his whole life. I don't know if you know the Pritzker family, Bob and Jay. Um, they started with millions and became double-digit billionaires by taking companies and buying them well, improving them, and selling, in some cases, them, and holding them when they could. Jim was their right-hand man, doing the deals for them and he was studying the way that some of the finest strategic thinkers on the planet thought, not only the Pritzkers, but others. And he came up with this list of iron laws that I find are a useful like a grammar, a building blocks for all strategic thinking. The first one is this, history drives strategy. History drives strategy. Most business people are amnesiacs. What is an amnesiac? Somebody who forgets. Uh, too many business people, especially engineers, I teach a lot of engineers, think history is bunk. No, history is going to drive you, and if you don't know your history, it's going to drive you uh, to destruction. And history can always drive you to destruction if you're trapped in it. Generals are always fighting the last war. So you need to know the ABCs of history, the history of the key actors in the business, the founders, the CEOs, the inventors, uh, your competitors, your team, yourself, the history of the actors. You need to know the B, the history of the business or brand. The brand is the promise you make to the customer. A good brand is a promise well kept. What promise is Durango making to uh, businesses coming in? What promise is Durango making to tourists? What promise is Durango making to the residents of the community? And how well are you keeping your promise? What's the history of the region beyond Durango, La Plata County, Ignacio, et cetera? History drives strategy. The third is the C, that's the history of the category or the sector or the industry, and that's about patterns. What happens in these old mining towns that were just all about silver when the silver goes away? And then you have to find new businesses and reinvent yourselves and reinvent yourselves. Uh, you need to know the history of the, of the category, the, the region. Two, focus equals power. Some of you are mathematically oriented. This is not a mathematical operator. Focus is not exactly equal to power. It means it inherently involves uh, gaining power. The focused player beats the unfocused player. I'm, I'm right-handed. It's my dominant hand. But if I do isometric exercises, my right hand cannot beat my left hand because it's not focused enough. The, the, the power gets diffuse. 
but my weaker left hand, if it focuses, can go right through. It's the power of the wedge. The military call this the concentration of force at the weak point of the enemy line. What you need to do as a strategist is look for the weak point. Look for the place you can win. Don't spread your resources widely. Focus, focus, focus. When you're a billionaire, then you diversify your financial portfolio, but while you're building your fortune, you focus it. Focus equals power. Speaking of diversification, uh, when you become super wealthy, you want to diversify your holdings. That's good financial portfolio theory. But I've just written here that diversification equals risk. Because in business, business diversification is a merger and acquisition or a line extension. Every time you acquire somebody, you actually introduce risk into the system. Every time you do a line uh, extension, a brand extension, you introduce risk into the system. It's just what it is. Don't be afraid of it. Just be aware of what's happening. That diversification of your business inherently involves risk. Uh, it gets worse. Innovation inherently involves uncertainty. Everyone wants to be innovative. You know, I, that's where I get paid for teaching people about innovative. We don't want it. I don't even want innovation in my cereal. You know, I, I, I want the same. I don't want innovation in my clothes. Look, you know the way I'm dressed today? It's the way I dress every single day at work. I have three Brooks Brothers blue blazers. I have ten Brooks Brothers blue um, no iron shirts. I have six pair of Brooks Brothers gray slacks and three pair of these slip-ons. Because when I wake up in the morning, I do not want to have an innovative thought about my dress because I make no money. I make no money from how I dress. It just has to pass a threshold. And so... You know, if I, when I wake up at 4.30 or 5, I reach in the closet and whatever I pull out is right. I don't want to innovate around my business model of my clothing. I want to save the bandwidth of my mind to innovate around stuff like new businesses. Because innovation is really hard. How much is it going to cost? I have no idea. Can we build it? I don't know. We never did it before. Will the market buy it? I don't know. It's never been offered in the market before. Will the government allow us to sell it? I don't know. So everyone says, I want to be innovative. You don't. Because innovation is this world of complete uncertainty. I'm talking about major game-changing innovation. And yet I love it. I live for it. When I am not starting a company, I just get antsy. And I go look for students. And I say, I'm almost pathetic. Would you start a company? I'll be your chairman. Non-executive. It's addictive to be part of innovation. But it's really scary stuff. Growth is magical. It's the happy iron law, Roger. When the county's growing and the businesses are thriving and people are coming in, don't you feel happy? Two thumbs up, he says. It's the happy iron law. Growth is magical, and so I don't want to teach you the sad iron law. It's just too much of a Debbie Downer. All growth will end. The longer version of that is all growth will end in a single product or a single market. Seven billion people on the planet, you can't sell to eight. Your new technology will be obsolete tomorrow. How do I know it? Because you made somebody obsolete yesterday. People used to ski on wooden skis, you know. Did any of you actually ever ski on a wooden ski? A few of you. How many of you are still skiing on wooden skis? <laughs> In between the skis we have today and the wooden ski, Howard Head innovated. Anybody of you remember the early 60s, Howard Head's metal skis? It was a game changer. And Howard Head got stuck in metal and ignored the rise of Kneisel and Rossignol coming in with fiberglass skis. You know what he said about them? Fiberglass skis are cheap crap. They fall apart under racing conditions. You know what the wood skier said about Howard Head's metal skis when he launched them? They're cheap, they're crap, they fall apart in racing conditions. History drives strategy and history can be a trap for us. All growth will end. It's this last law that should keep you awake at night. Um, I got off a plane a couple of years ago on the East Coast. I was wearing my University of Chicago Blue School of Business hat. Man a couple rows in front of me turned around, grabbed his grip bag. And he saw my hat and he pointed to himself and said, GSB 95. So he, many went to the school before we changed our name. Why did we change our name? Because one of our alumni gave us $300 million and we said thank you and changed our name. If you give me $300 million, you can call me any freaking thing you want to call me. <laughs> um, so I got off the plane. I wasn't teaching in 95. And I said, did you by any chance have Professor Jim Schrager? Without missing a beat, this is what he said. All growth will end. 
He said, it was one of my number one takeaways from business school. I went on to be a CEO. I thought about it every day. He says, now I'm on a director of corporate boards. I know the management's handling the general processes. I want to know what's going to kill this thing. I want to know how to keep it alive. And so you go back and you say, where in history do we find clues for growth? It's important to mine, and no pun intended, mine the history of Durango through its various cycles to find out where do we see patterns that can help us grow again? Focus equals power. Where do we focus our very limited resources, our capital and our people to get a breakthrough? Do we need to buy something, acquire something, do slight brand extensions, diversify? Or do we now have to get into that really scary but vibrant world of innovation so that can we re can start the, the jump, start the growth engine? Uh, Charles Handy talks about the S-curve. You start out investing money looking for product market fit and it just goes down through time. If you don't find product market fit, you go out of business. The goal is to turn that curve and to get back to break even. Remember the story earlier in the morning? But the purpose of a business is not to get break even, it's to get the growth part of the curve. And when you're in that growth after you've spent all that painful time risking your career and your reputation and your house, and your shareholders' capital. You don't want to invest anymore. You just want to milk the cow. Because you'd like to believe that the chart goes up to the right forever and ever. Amen, alleluia, amen. And it doesn't work that way. It's called the Gompertz function. If those are, I'm at University of Chicago. You've got to say stuff like that. It's, it's, it's an S-curve. It, it goes like this. And it flattens at the top of the curve. And it begins to decay. And you've got to start making investments in the growth part of the curve when you have capital so that you can survive the flattening of what has been historically your cash cow. Because if you start investing late, you won't have enough capital to survive. We at the University of Chicago are trying to find the science behind strategy. There are two primary ways people study strategy or leadership. One is um, eminence-based, the other is evidence-based. Eminence-based would be, um, so Steve Jobs is a famous strategist, what did he do? Mark Zuckerberg has been very successful, what did he do? Um, and it's useful to see these patterns and what they've done, but what's the limit with studying the life of Steve Jobs? I'm not Steve Jobs. And my history is different than his. So I have to be careful about just emulating slavishly, but that's eminence-based. Evidence-based says, what are the skills, techniques that can be measured that are true to all good strategists? Uh, one thing we know is they're usually very good at negotiating. Um, they're better at predicting in their industry than others. Can we measure that? And at Booth, because we're such a quant school, we're trying to measure the things that lead to success, and we're doing a lot of research into the psychology of decision making, and we've really been a key pioneer in the field of behavioral strategy. My colleague Jim Schrager and Al Medansky have been leading this charge for a long time. Um, it, it's become easier with the rise of people like Dick Thaler and Danny Kahneman as they've um, plowed and got, gotten Nobels for behavioral psychology as such, behavioral economics as such. But we're trying to think about this narrow set of the leader making strategic decisions. Um, how do experts formulate strategy uh, in a generic way? Not how did one person do it, but how does it work across all human beings and cultures? And, um, and how do we decide what to do? Uh, you'll have to come to the school. We have a great course on advanced strategy program, building and implementing the growth strategy. It's week long, it costs $10,000 per person, and um, it's a great thing about t teaching at a business school. You can sell just shamelessly. So we would love to have you come and, and, and spend more of your dollars to uh, learn how to think better, but that's all I can give you is that little teaser ad. So um, I'll give you a quick definition of strategy, though, that comes out of the behavioral science approach. Strategy is the decision we make. It's not the output. It's the decision we make in the present based on learning from the past um, about how to grow or defend in the future. So it's really all about decisions. 
and do we make well, d our decisions well? How do we improve the quality of our decisions to grow and defend our business? I'll tell you a story about this, a, a story that comes from uh, chess, because chess is a strategy game. It's about one of the finest chess players of all time, Jose Raul Capablanca. Uh, by the time he was 19 or 20, he was already a ranked master. He's from Havana, Cuba. He crosses over to Miami and takes on the Ch Miami Chess Club that are not ranked as highly as he is. Uh, 28 players took him on on that given day. He stood white, which means he got to move first. In chess, by the way, first mover is a statistical advantage. Um, uh, MBAs sometimes talk a lot about buzzwords, and one of their favorite buzzwords is first mover advantage. What I try to tell them is, in business, first mover is always a, almost always a disadvantage. First mover is only an advantage if you can protect it. In fact, if you look at almost all of the great businesses, the first mover gets washed out. Uh, the Friendster just didn't make any money for the founder. And all the patents that the founder of Friendster developed were bought by Facebook. I think the founder of Friendster walked away with a million dollars. Mark Zuckerberg is what? Is he worth 35 billion today? Um, he was early. You don't want to be late. But um, beware of this buzzword, first mover advantage. It's only an advantage if you can protect it. But in a game like chess, first mover is a statistical advantage. And he's moving first. He goes to board one, makes his move, board two, 10, 20, 28, comes back to board one, he pauses for a second, makes his ply. Ply is the technical word for response in chess. Goes to the second board, pauses, makes his ply, and keeps moving. He goes around all day long, never pausing at any board for more than two seconds. Uh, now, think of the advantages he's giving up. One man playing 28. Um, they're focused, and focus equals power. He's juggling 28 asynchronous games. He pauses for a second or two. They get two to three minutes to consider their ply. Um, but at the end of the day, he won 28 out of 28 chess matches. And somebody said to him, Jose Raul, you got lucky. Now look at the eyes on that young man. You think he thought he was lucky? No, he thought he was good. He said, I'll prove it. And he, he went on the road, and he played in five more North American cities. He played 168 chess matches, and he won 168 chess matches. He's one of the finest simultaneous players of all time. He's not 100% through his career. I think he's in the 92 or 93% in his career, but on this tour, he's 100% wins. A chess reporter came up to him and said, um, Jose Raul, how many moves ahead do you see? People always wonder, does the chess master uh, see three moves into the game, four moves into the game, 10 moves into the game. And understand how hard it is to see ahead. If you play chess, you'll know four moves into the game. You've got about four billion possible moves on that little chess board in the heart of the game, in the heart of the middle game. Uh, mathematicians estimate you've got about 10 to the 126 possible moves. Um, to give you a sense of how big that number is, astronomers say there are about 10 to the 122 suns in the universe. So there's a lot of possible moves, and it could cripple you. But as a leader, we can't be crippled by all the possibilities. Uh, we have to make a move on the board. You know, consultants don't have to make a decision. They write a report and bill you. But you're the manager of the company who, who has to make the decision and execute it, and he has to make a move on the board. So they ask him, how many moves ahead do you see? And he said something that has been... Um, puzzling decision scientists for decades said this, I see just one move ahead. It's the right move. So was he joking? He was famous for his sense of humor. Um, was he bragging? He was legendarily arrogant. Was he teaching us how experts see their field of expertise? We now know the last is true, that an expert looking at her field of expertise, sees more than a novice sees. Uh, she knows there's 10 to the 126 possible moves or whatever the N is in her space. She knows she's got to make a move. What she's trying to do is what's the most high probability move and make the move. Strategists need to consider the various scenarios. A, a fabulous way to think about it is a win scenario, you know, outsized success. 
run in number of those scenarios, what leads to outside success. Then do something that um, Gary Klein, a fabulous uh, decision researcher, but non-academic, um, he's a field researcher, says, a, he calls it a pre-mortem. He says, examine in advance all the ways you can fail and think what will cause us to fail. So do a success scenario plan, do a pre-mortem scenario plan, and then Steve Johnson in his, I think it's his latest book, Farsighted, um, talks about doing a weird scenario plan. Like something, you, it just seems so improbable, but, but run it. Um, so to give you an example of that, the newspapers would have done, this is how we continue to grow our empire through uh, consolidation of our markets and stuff like that. How are we likely to fail? We're not going to execute well enough and a competitor is going to take us. What they never dreamed of was the three people that would take their business away. The three people that took their business away, Craig Newmark, well, it was four people, Craig Newmark, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page, Sergey Brin. And when they started their businesses, they weren't thinking about newspapers. You know, M Craig Newmark of Craigslist, he was just trying to find friends when he moved to the West Coast. Mark Zuckerberg was doing what every college kids ever want to do, is just find a friend, so to speak. And um, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were glorified librarians doing page ranking of academic citation. When they started out, it's a weird scenario. So you've got to look and say, you know, what's the scenario where we win? What's the scenario where we lose? Let's do some weird scenarios and then just see the most logical move, the highest probability way to win on the board. Do you see the most logical move? Take a moment for yourself and write down, it's good if you write it, don't show it to people, one big goal for your life or work, get it in mind. Um, You know what strategy will help you attain the goal? If you see the right move. So the goal is where you want to go. The strategy is how you're going to get there. If you can't see your strategy, why not? Is it because you're new to the space or is it because your space has been disrupted? What data is going to help you make your decisions? Um, it's really important to be data driven. Uh, we're often very intuitively driven, and it used to be people thought intuition was pure mystery. What we now know is that intuition is nothing more and nothing less than recognition. You've seen it somewhere before, and in your inchoate part of your mind, you're able to pull it up. But isn't it better if you could put some numbers on that inchoate intuition? And so finally, we come to the concept of VUCA. It dis it's a military acronym. It describes the battlefield. Uh, military science is, all, uh, is much about planning. It's important to plan out your battles, but General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who later becomes president of the United States, has a great quote, planning is essential, plans are worthless. It's because every soldier knows five minutes after the bullets start flying, the plan goes out the window. But you need to have done that foresightedness. You need to begin thinking about the future, and then you have to be adaptive very quickly. And that fast agility, especially in the markets we live in today, is an important trait. If you simply say, it's in the strat plan, but your whole world has changed, you are a victim of history. And so the military described the battlefield with these four words. The battlefield is volatile. The battlefield is filled with uncertainty. The battlefield is complex to the point of chaotic. And the battlefield is filled with ambiguity. As a manager, you should hate every one of those words. As a leader, you should hate all of them and feel nauseous. Because actually, you know the word for management? It's the same Latinate root that turns into hand in Spanish. What's the word for hand in Spanish? Mano. Managers are the people who take the wild stallion by the reins and bring it under control. That's your job as a manager is to control this circumstance. But it turns out sometimes VUCA is out of control. I gave this talk a couple of years ago. Um, and a man who was about my age, who was general manager of a large Fortune 50 company in their largest division, came up to me in the break and he said, that describes every day of my life at work. I hate my job. And he says, but I can't tell anybody about it. Why can't he tell anyone about it? One, it's lonely at the top. But the other reason is you don't want your boss going, it's a VUCA world out there. 
And you don't want to have your, your boss hear you say it because they'll say, it's why I hired you. And so he said something really interesting at that moment. He said, there are times my life is so, and he learns the acronym, my life is so VUCA, I want to call, and does he says, I want to call my mommy. But my mommy can't help me with this problem, he said. So there and then on the spot, he and I started a 12-step program. So, so you know what a 12-step program is? You've got some problem with something like alcohol. You don't want to tell the whole world about your problem. You find some other fellow strugglers. You get in a confidential room, and you tell your story to get healed. So we decided we would start the I Want My Mommy's Anonymous group for business leaders. And here's how it works. When you go into the room, and let's, let's run a session right now just for a minute, and I'll be the one who will go first. Um, you get in this confidential room, and you say, hi, my name is Greg. And everyone says, hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. And then you say, um, I want my mommy. And everyone in the room goes, hmm. Say, hmm. I feel the sympathy. Oh, that's, I have a feeling there have been days you've wanted your mommy at work, you know. Most recently it happened when I was on a corporate board, um, a fiduciary, I was the oldest member of the board. I'm from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, number one or two in all the league charts we care about. And um, a huge 800-pound gorilla came into our niche. We had not expected this. And, um, and worse than that, there's some new entrants, some startups that are ankle-biting around us that we had not expected. Our management team were great. They were really good people. They were younger than I was. They'd never been in waters like this before. Their world's going very VUCA. And they turned to me in the board meeting and go, what do we do? And it was at this moment, I wanted my mommy. I had no idea, but you don't want to say, I'm from the U University of Chicago and I teach strategy and I'm clueless now and really nervous about my investment. So you have to, you have to go like, hmm, we'll get through it, guys. Let's keep running scenarios. Uh, here's the reason this is so important. If you've studied the history of battles, almost no battle, battle has ever been fought on the front, has been lost on the front line. Battles are lost when the general on the hill, on the high horse, loses confidence and begins to back away. And as the pressure comes off the rear, the people in the front feel it and know they're being abandoned. They turn, they throw their shields down, and they're slaughtered from the rear. Your job as a leader in a VUCA world is not to panic. You may feel nervous. Have any of you read U.S. Grant's memoirs? Some of the best political memoirs you'll ever read, and they weren't ghostwritten, just fabulous prose. He talks about one of the first times he leads troops into battle. He said, I was physically sick. I was so afraid. But then I remembered who was on the other side of the lines. I'd been at West Point with him. I thought, I bet he's thrown up in the bushes too. He said, and my job is to lead my troops to win, and he just sucked it up and led. In a VUCA world, there's no point in panicking. Find a way to win. And if you can't win, because there are some unwinnable battles, get your troops out intact as possible and redeploy them the next time. Protect the capital and the asset and your people, because not every battle is winnable. But if you panic, you create panic in your troops. Strategy is seeing how to win, even when you're feeling like you need your mommy. Now, here are the two main things I've noticed that business people do to solve this. One is tall glasses of scotch. The other is Xanax. Now, both of these can be short-term solutions in an acute moment, but they're bad long-term. Um, so if, if you need to deal with this, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy actually has the most peer-reviewed efficacy of anything to deal with these kind of stressful things. Go practice CBT. Uh, and, and what CBT is, is it's like the Shaolin warrior in all the martial arts films. When the ninja stars are flying in and the lances are coming and it's all VUCA, at that moment you've seen it. You know, the film goes into super slow-mo and the Shaolin warrior goes like this. You've actually got to still your heart and your mind because you're not paid to panic. You may be panicked. You're paid to win. And if you can't win, you're paid to get your people out as intact as possible. You don't have to be a leader. But if you sign up for a leader, your job is to protect them. Your job is to delight a customer. Your job is to 
help grow the market. Here's a Buka event. Facebook, in March, lost billions of dollars in shareholder value. What caused the collapse of shareholder value there? Cambridge Analytic and privacy breaches. This young man gives us a textbook on how to handle VUCA. Uh, this is, by the way, leadership is two things. It's thinking about how to solve difficult problems, that strategy, and getting work done through people. That's leadership and management. Um, and that part is all theater. Uh, doing the mental math, the solving the problem, isn't theater. That's just hard mental effort. But do you know that leadership in VUCA times is all about theater and what costumes you wear, what symbols you use, how you deport yourself? This is his costume every day in the valley. Not this valley, his valley, Silicon Valley. He wears a gray t-shirt, gray jeans, a gray hoodie, because his costume is for his key troops who are hackers and developers who showed up that day at Facebook wearing old ratty t-shirts with an Atari logo or something on them. And so he wants to look like his troops. Now, by the way, the shirt he has on, it's not your normal t-shirt. It's Brunello Cuccinelli, $357 at retail. So I want to tell him, go to Costco. It's six bucks, you know, but this is his uniform. But when he gets summoned to Washington, there's a different audience he has to dress for. And he puts on a different costume. He puts on a suit and tie because he knows that the people he has to appeal to at that moment do not trust people who dress like this. And he's got to protect his troops. He's got to protect his shareholders. He's got to protect his customers. And to protect them, he changes costume. He puts on a different armor. And he puts on a different mind. And he has to think the way these people think. And what we realize is these people are clueless about technology. There was a senator who says, I asked my granddaughter about Facebook. He asked his freaking granddaughter. This is one of the most important businesses in the West. And he asked his granddaughter. Mark Zuckerberg is the age of his granddaughter. You know, he's what, 33, 34. He, 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 you can see on his face, he wants to go, are you a complete imbecile moron? But he, 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 he paused. He's the Shaolin warrior. He goes, that's a good question. And he says something really interesting. He said, I started it. I'm responsible for it. I'll fix it. And I'm sorry. And when he walked out of Washington, he was $3 billion personally richer. Now, his stock's going to bounce around as our society tries to figure out what to do with social media. But it's a case book in how to handle VUCA. Brexit is a case in how to handle VUCA. The British decide that they want to leave the EU, and it roils the entire globe. Um, Henry Kissinger, controversial figure, but one of the most brilliant statesmen, has studied the history of Europe forever, and he wrote a long op-ed piece for the Wall Street Journal, and in it he says, uh, Europe comes together in empire and it breaks apart into fiefdom. He says, it came together in the EU, it's breaking apart into nation states. He's giving a historical context. History drives strategy. It's important to know history. The greatest lesson history has to teach us is that we don't learn the great lessons of history, but great strategists do. Henry Kissinger didn't write the title. The editor for the Wall Street Journal wrote the title, and I can prove it to you, because Henry Kissinger writes in a very pedantic and academic way. I won't imitate his Austrian accent, but I'll give you a sense of it. This is what he says. The cascade of commentary on Britain's decision to leave institutional Europe has described the epochal event primarily in the vocabulary of calamity. Now look, I got a really high score on my SAT. I have no idea what he just wrote. The editor does. He says, it's turmoil! Ah! But that's not the money quote. Here's the money quote. However, the coin of the realm for statesmen is not anguish or recrimination. It should be to transform setback into opportunity. What the hell did he just say? The editor knows there's an opportunity. Here's the insight that I want to leave you with. The world has always had VUCA, but the pace of the disruptions is coming faster and faster. It can be very troubling. It can be very disturbing. The instinct of most people is to go, ah! That's your lizard brain talking, your reptilian brain. It's your fight or flight. You should listen to it. But we are not reptiles. 
We are human beings, and we developed a layer over top of the reptilian brain. It looks like macaroni and cheese in the videos, but it's your neocortex. It's where all the rational thought happens. And the rational thought has analyzed VUCA conditions and said, the greatest fortunes have come out of VUCA. Warren Buffett says, when there's blood on the street, it's the time to invest. When you've had a difficult year in Durango and La Plata County, Everyone else is complaining, they're blaming, they're pointing fingers, they're afraid. This is the time to win, folks. When you lose out to another tourist area and you go, oh, damn, we lost to them, they're all the power player. They got this is the time to win. Leaders look for the way to win. It's nice to be here today. It's nice to be with winners. I look forward to coming back next year and finding out that the county, the region, the city, and your businesses have made so much money that you've decided to make a donation to the University of Chicago <laughs> in a sum, net present value of the 300 million already contributed, that will allow us to rename ourselves the La Plata Business School. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time.